All right, so let's um, go ahead and get started We're on page 11 in your uh, packet, the morning review. All right, so an object uh, moving along a horizontal line has V of T. So make sure you're in radian mode. Uh, we'll put this in our calculator and we're basically um, creating a velocity graph. So you go to Y equals. Enter in your function. Make sure you're all, always using the variable T. Sorry, you always use the variable X and never use any other variable besides X in your calculator. Um, the bounds go from 0 to 11, so you can go to window, you can go 0 to 11 on your x min, x max. For me, though, I like to see a little bit around my edges. I'll click on window. You go uh, 0 to 11, that's your x min, x max. That's what the bounds are. But I like to go a little further left and further right so that I know so my ends are not right at the edge. Uh, but that's just my, my preference. Um, you can start from negative 10 to 10 for your Y min and Y max. Those are usually standard values, but you can always go back and adjust if you feel like, wait, I have a little higher, a little lower, and then you hit graph. So it looks like my graph is, um, you know, there's a peak, there's a valley. Um, for me, though, I don't want to just, I just want to kind of adjust, just kind of play around with it. You can adjust your window just a little bit further uh, south, and I mean, a little bit lower, Y valley, a little, a little, um, uh, little lower uh, Y valley, a little higher, maybe X valley. That you don't have to do this, but I just sometimes I want to get us as um, as much of what I want to see on the graph, if I can zoom in a little bit, so I'll do like negative six. Let's see what happens here. So that my peaks and valleys and my oh, okay, it looks like I just cut that off a little bit low here. So I'll do Y min is negative eight. How's that? But basically, I want to want you guys to be able to to just adjust your graph by using y min, y max, x min, x max to uh, kind of so you can see all the important parts. OK, so it says create a sign line for V of t. If this is a V of t equation, we know we can pick off the x intercept. Um, pick off the x intercept. Um, looks like one is landing at zero, but you can always double check that. You can do second trace. Um, Zero. Option two. Left bound. So I'm going to scroll to a point to the left of my uh, first x intercept. I know where my target is, but I don't want to put my cursor on my target. I want to give the calculator room to 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 look between two x values I gave it. Hit enter. Now you're going to scroll to a point on the other side of the X and of, the, of your target. Hit enter. So now the calculator knows to look between these two points and it's going to find the X intercept for you. So it's going to say guess question mark. You hit enter. It's going to find that value for you. OK, repeat the process for the other uh, X intercept zero. Scroll to. Uh, yes. Were you just tracing? Or what? Um, oh, OK, you mean for, for this one, but for this one. Um, yeah, you're right. These, yeah, yeah. Huh? Yeah, but uh, I, I, yeah, in this case, it looks like these are just nice whole numbers. So if you just hit trace, um, it may not give you an accurate value. Does that make sense? 
So uh, the, the more accurate, the, the better accuracy is to go second trace and zero and let the calculator find that X intercept for you. Okay. Um, okay. Repeat the same process. And for this point, it ends up being nine. Okay. So we can create our velocity sign line here. So if you look at your graph here, um, we know that this is a velocity graph. So anything above the x-axis is positive slope or um, positive velocity. Anything below the x-axis is a negative velocity. So uh, we're starting off at zero. So actually, we're not. Um, uh, actually, I shouldn't have had to test that x value. That should have been just given to me. Uh, so, but up, up between zero and three, we see that the graph is clearly above the x-axis. So that's a positive. Velocity. Okay. Between three and nine, we clearly see the graph is below the x-axis, so negative velocity. To the right, between nine and eleven, above the x-axis, so positive velocity. We also want to create a sign line for uh, acceleration. Or think of it as um, your concavity, right? So if you're looking at your uh, first derivative graph, where are your Points of inflection of your original of your original graph. Um, well, the zeros will be where velocity is zero. Uh, peaks and valleys, right? Okay, yeah. So, um, so the max and mids, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so the way we can get to those max and mids, if you do max because you're looking for a max, you can hit four and do the same thing that you did for x intercept. You'll pick a point to the left of your max and enter. Take a point to the right of your max. Hit enter. And now the calculator will look between those two points to try to find the maximum for you. So you see the word guess question mark. Hit enter again. We'll find that max for you. So 1.643. Can you press um, zero or max So yeah, so if you're looking for a next intercept, you'll do zero. If you want to look for a, a, a max for your graph, then you select max. If you want to look for a minimum, you'll select minimum. So uh, for this next one, I see a chance for a minimum because I see a minimum here. So I selected uh, the option minimum, and now I'm just going to pick a point to the left of my lowest point, and then pick a point on the other side of my lowest point. I'm going to find that minimum for me, 6.542. Hit enter. That's fine. Yeah. So, um, so I have my if I'm looking at my concavity uh, behavior, I'm looking at my slope, right? So wherever positive slope is, that's concave up. Wherever negative slope is, that's concave down. Wherever positive slope is, that's concave up. So we can also translate it to, to acceleration. Positive slope means positive acceleration. Negative slope means negative acceleration. Positive slope means positive acceleration. Find the times when object is motionless. Well, we already gathered a lot of information here because these are places where velocity is zero. So object is motionless when velocity is uh, at zero, at three, and nine. And technically at zero too, because we see that it actually hits the X intercept at zero. <laughs> Find the velocity at four seconds. So I can plug four into the velocity function. You can do it just uh, replacing the T's with four. Or another option is if you go to your home screen, well, okay, so one option you can do is you can do um, trick and trace. If I'm looking for a value, if, if, if you can see it on the graph, you can just type four 
and they'll give you that Y value, which is negative two. Okay. Another option is if you go back to your home screen, you can call the function that's stored in Y1. You see how Y1 is storing that velocity function? So if we do alpha trace, you see that alpha trace here? Alpha trace, you're going to see that option show up, that menu list. If you select Y1, you do parentheses four, and the calculator will just plug four into whatever is stored, into the variables for whatever is stored in your Y1. My velocity is negative two inches per second. Or part D, find the acceleration at four seconds. So acceleration is the first derivative of velocity. So if we do math eight, math eight will take you to n derivative. So d over dx, I want to put in my velocity function and ask the calculator to get to my acceleration for me. So again, alpha trace. will help you get to your menu, Y1. We want to find acceleration at four. So we're making the calculator do all the work for us. Negative 2.314. Okay. Units of measure is in, uh, meters per second squared. We're talking about um, acceleration. So, um, for part E, is the object speed increasing or decreasing? We see that velocity and acceleration have different, sorry, same signs. They're both negative. So if they have same signs, we know the speed is increasing. Final total displacement. Displacement is just the definite integral from, from A to B of your velocity function. So if you go to math nine, math nine, you can pull out that, uh, pull up the FN integral. And just plug in what you would expect, lower bound, upper bound, Al uh, alpha trace gets you to your Y1 function. I'm sorry, 0 to 11, my bad. Negative 10.993. Uh, math eight will be n derivative will be other uh, derivative feature, and so this negative ten point nine nine three. The reason why this negative is because this is telling us that between zero and eleven, this object is going to have a displacement of negative eleven inches, meaning that it's going to travel. It's going to be going left. It's going to cover a distance of 11 units in the in the other direction, in the in the left direction. Okay, next up, total distance. Total distance. Um, you're just going to uh, you'll you'll use the depth integral, but you have to involve absolute value. So you'll do math nine from zero to eleven. There's an absolute uh, value feature, which is under math. If you click on math, scroll over to number, you see that ABS, math number ABS. So make sure the absolute value is inside the between the integral and dx, but surrounding the velocity function. So alpha trace gets you to your velocity function, dx. May take a little bit here to get there.
Okay, uh, I'm not going to put this on a test, uh, the um, minimum velocity, and um, but basically you would just scroll to a point where the graph is at its lowest point um, of your, to determine the minimum velocity, which is the lowest uh, graph of your velocity graph. So uh, H and I get that, and also L. So we'll just do two more here. We'll do J and K. So with J, uh, notice how there's some distinction here between displacement versus distance versus finding a position. So they're all kind of related to each other, but um, there's a different way that we approach each. So displacement is just however much progress you've made from, um, from your starting point to your ending point. Um, Distance is how much how, how much motion did you actually achieve in that time interval? So if you're going forwards and backwards, you're counting everything as a positive value. A final position is involving displacement, but it's having a starting point. It's asking, okay, if you're on the x-axis, and if I told you that you're starting at a specific x value at a specific time, where on the x-axis are you going to end up? Um, you know, a time interval later. So you basically you start off with a starting point. You figure out how much uh, movement you've made in that time interval. You add those together, and then you end up with where where your final position is. So that's a little bit different than displacement. Displacement just wants to know how far you are from where you started, but it's not seeking a specific location. Uh, I think our students they com confuse things and they want to do an initial position plus. Distance for distance. Distance again doesn't care uh, where you end up. It just wants to know how much you traveled, um, how, how much movement you made over the course of your interval. So don't confuse that with total distance. So if we're starting with um, a given location, x of 0 equals 3, we want to find x of 11. We know that any final position I'm looking for. It's going to be a given starting location plus however much progress I made between those time intervals. There's my setup. I'm starting at location three. And then this in the calculator I already gathered from part F. I know I moved around negative 10.99. So if I start at location three and I'm if I move to the left 11 inches, then I'm going to end up at negative 7.993 on the x axis. Okay, next up, find the average velocity. Average velocity, we can use average value theorem. So average value theorem is 1 over b minus a, integral from a to b of b of t dt. All right, 0 to 11, not 1 to 11. So it's basically 1 11th times my displacement. So I can use my displacement value, which I already found. I know I traveled or met, a net, uh, I made a net gain of 11 inches in the left direction. So then uh, what's my average velocity over that time interval? So I take however much distance I, I uh, achieve divided by the time that passes, and that will give me my average velocity. Let me go through each of the problems and then I'd be happy to walk around and answer any individual questions you guys have. Okay, so uh, next page here. The graph of F consists of a line segment um, given here. So this is my F graph.
So uh, G is sitting at a level above F. So if I want to find the derivative of G, basically a derivative. I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, basically, my the derivative of that function that's sitting there. So if you recall, second theorem says that if I pair a derivative and integral next to each other, they're just going to end up undoing or canceling each other out. So when that happens, I'm basically down to that F level. Right? And then the upper bound gets inserted into the variable. So F of T becomes F of X. So we know G prime is F of X, which means that this F is really the G prime graph. This is really the derivative graph for G. So now if I know G prime is F, G double prime will take F and make turn into its derivative, which is F prime. So it says find g of 4, g of 4, we go to our uh, definition, g of 4 is from 2 to 4 of f of t. So I like reading a graph um, from left to right, and this is exactly what's showing, so no need for adjustment. Um, make sure that you're only looking at the region between the graph and the x-axis. Some, some of you may try to create different shapes with the y-axis, but we don't care about that region. We only care about these regions here. And this is the only, these are the only areas that you're looking at. Whatever is above is positive and whatever is below is negative. Go from two to four. One half base times height for my triangle. The area of that rectangle is one. 2 to 4, 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves, so 1.5. And find g of negative 2, so I'm just going to follow my definition here from 2 to negative 2. So here I see my bounds a little bit out of order. I would prefer to read from left to right. Otherwise, everything is backwards. This is positive and this is negative. So that just feels um, I have to, to do a lot in my head. So I want to just flip those bounds so I can read the graph like I prefer to read. So from negative 2 to 2. So from negative 2 to 2, I have a, a square triangle and a triangle, right? So this is one, one half base times height, this is one half. This here is one half base times height. This is all gonna end up being negative one. So I total that region together. I have one plus one half minus one. That just gives me one half. Wait, hold on. Yeah. It gives me one half, but Remember, I flipped the bounds, so I need to keep track of that uh, change I made. So there's a negative that needs to be pulled out. So 1.5 minus 1 is 1 half, but then I'm keeping that negative in front, so negative 1 half. Next up, find g double prime of negative 3.5. So g double prime of negative 3.5 is same thing as f prime of negative 3.5. And we're asking for the slope, right? The slope of f, the derivative of f is slope of f. So whatever the slope of this line is, uh, up one over one, slope is one. For what value of x is g increasing? So keep in mind, this is the g prime graph. So we can create our label, the fact that it is a derivative graph, and we have to interpret accordingly. So your x-intercepts are where your g graph is 
has a slope zero. So I'll pick out negative three, zero, and two. So to the left, up between negative four and negative three, it's clearly below the x-axis, so negative slope. Between negative three and zero, all this is sitting above, so positive slope. Between zero and two, negative slope, because it's below the x-axis. And between two and four, above the x-axis, positive slope. So we can kind of imagine how the real graph is moving. It's falling, rising, falling, rising. So relative min at negative three and two, relative max at zero, increasing. We just look for the up arrows here. So negative three to zero, and then from two to four. And decreasing, you can just say negative four to negative three, and then from zero to two. Because g prime is greater than zero for increasing, and because uh, Oops, sorry. Um, I'll just do this here. So here, it's it's not saying where G is decreasing. It's saying where G prime is decreasing. Well, this is a G, this is a G prime graph. So G prime decreasing. You should look at the graph here, right? So G prime is decreasing here. Asking for where G prime is decreasing. So that's actually easier because you can just look at the graph and tell. Decreasing from negative one to one. Because G double prime is less than zero. And G double prime. Yeah, or you can say because um, G graph, uh, G prime is is um, decreasing in this value. They can also refer to G double prime. Part H, uh, find the absolute extrema. So this is EBT, extreme value theorem. So the way you start off EBT is you want to find your candidates, and your candidates are going to come from your slope sign. Okay. So we know how the graph is going to move. We know uh, where it's going to start, where it's going to end. We see relative mins and relative maxes. So these are all candidates. Okay. So your max and mins have to be at one of these X values. Oh, sorry. It's only asking, uh, my bad, between negative one and three. So we only have to test negative one, zero, two, and three. I forgot to look at the endpoints there between negative one and three. So uh, I'll test negative one for sure. I'll test zero. I'll test two. And I'll test three. And okay, we have to go to our go back to our definition. Our definition is going to Tell us how to get to a uh, y value for our G graph. So G of negative one, we go from two to negative one. Notice the bounds are out of order. Going to flip it, change the sign. Okay, so from negative one to two. That's going to be one half minus one, which is negative one half. 
negative one half, but then I'm changing the sign of that. So negative or negative is a positive. Okay, g of zero. I'm going from two to zero. Again, out of order. Put the bounds. So from zero to two, I see negative one. Put that down, change the sign. Negative of negative is positive. G of two, what's nice about G of two here? Yeah, which is zero because my bounds are the same. So if my bounds are the same, I haven't achieved any width. If there's no width, there's no rectangle, there's no area. Okay, G of three. So from two to three. We see clearly above the x axis, so positive one half, that's the area, that triangle. No need to change bounds, so just one half. All right, so then we know that all of our candidates are within these four, uh, um, looking at these four y values. The highest y value is your absolute max, the lowest y value is your absolute min. I only care about the y value. Okay, let's look at number three here. Uh, the following table shows the size of an incoming wave headed towards the shore at a given moment. Use the trapezoid um, sum with six subsequent, uh, six sub intervals indicated by the data uh, to approximate uh, the area of the face of the wave. So we have the height, we have the distance from the left of the wave, and then if we accumulate that, we know that anytime we take the antiderivative, or anything involving with antiderivative, what's going to happen to our units? It's going to, uh, well, the units will change, right? So instead of feet, it's now going to be feet squared. Yeah. If it was like feet per minute, then feet per minute would just become feet, right? So um, here there's no rate here, so, uh, so feet times feet is square feet. Okay, so trapezoidal sum. Uh, so we can say the integral from 0 to 53 of f of x dx. It's not going to be exact, but it is going to be an approximation. Trapezoid is width over 2, or 1 half width, height 1 plus height 2. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Subtract the, um, the x's to get your width. And then you add um, two heights per trapezoid.
open all that up. Estimates um, the definite integral from zero to three using three middle rectangle. Right. Anything um, with area is definite integral. Okay, so three middle rectangles. So I have this is one interval, second interval, third interval. So from zero to eighteen, that's a width of eighteen. From eighteen to thirty-six, that's a width of eighteen. And from thirty-six to fifty-three, that's a width of seventeen. And then we want to pick off the appropriate height. The height we want the middle. So the middle, make sure that you're picking that. Five there for the first rectangle, 26 for the second rectangle, and then seven for the third rectangle. These are both related in the sense that they're both trying to estimate the same region, but uh, different numbers because we're using different methods and different shapes. RC, find the average height, so average value theorem. Uh, A and B values are 0 and 53. And it says from part B, so part B is 677, so I'm going to take that 677, substitute it into this piece right here. So 677 divided by 53. I'll walk around see if you guys have any questions, any tabular questions, or anything um, from previous slides. Uh, that's right. It says it's find the average height. So height. Yeah, let me show you. Yeah, I know. It's going to be for a maintenance PBA question where we're not getting the draft. Oh, 